Welcome to the presentation of the 20th Annual Gruber Genetics Prize. My name is Denise Montel, if you're just joining us, and I'm the president of the Genetic Society of America. The Annual Gruber Pro Genetics Prize is awarded for groundbreaking contributions to any realm of genetics research. GSA partners with Gruber on the Genetics Prize, recommending the expert advisors that maintain its scientific integrity. We are also pleased to partner on the Rosalind Franklin Young Investigator Award, created in honor of the groundbreaking contributions of Dr. Franklin and to inspire and support new generations of women in the field of genetics. The current Rosalind Franklin Fellows are Berenice Benayoun and Molly Schumer. We are pleased to host the Gruber Foundation and invite their executive director, Sarah Rea, to say a few words about the foundation and the prize. Sarah? Thank you, Dr. Montel, and welcome all of you. Let me just share my screen. All right, welcome on behalf of the Gruber Foundation. We are delighted to participate in the Allied Genetics Conference to honor Bonnie Bassler, who joins an illustrious genetics laureate list that we are very proud of. She also joins the recipients of the Cosmology and Neuroscience Prizes on our 2020 roster. They will be announced this spring, so stay tuned. If you are considering nominating for a Gruber Prize, note that we encourage nominations that reflect the breadth of the fields and the diversity of those working within them. Before we return to genetics, I would like to acknowledge our founders, Peter and Patricia Gruber, whose combined vision and leadership established the International Prize Program, and whose care in doing so gave it the legs to stand on its own. Pat and Peter had the foresight, the foresight to pair with scientific organizations such as the Genetic Society of America, GSA nominated the members of the Distinguished Selection Advisory Board that chose Bonnie Bassler for the prize. We sincerely appreciate the knowledge, commitment, and enthusiasm that these advisors bring to the judging process. Let me now invite a member of this board, Alan Spradling, to present the official prize citation and introduce the scientific accomplishments of our recipient. Dr. Spradling? Thank you, Sarah. The Gruber Foundation proudly presents the 2020 Genetics Prize to Bonnie Bassler for her pioneering and groundbreaking discoveries, illuminating the molecular language of bacterial communication through quorum sensing. She vastly expanded our understanding of the molecular, chemical, and mechanistic signals that, uh, that bacteria use to communicate, not only with their own species, but also between species. Her work has greatly expanded our understanding of the microbial world and open up the possibility of modulating bacterial communication to treat human disease and to manipulate the microbiome. Dr. Bassler, the prize committee recognizes you for your extraordinary ability, almost with regularity, to transcend the arc of normal science and discover previously unimagined aspects of the natural world. Your formula for success is not a secret. You apply a succession of appropriate and rigorous techniques, either in your own lab or through close productive collaborations, that focus relentlessly on the question at hand until you reach astonishing outcomes. Without so much of a pause, you follow up on the new ideas, model them, and test their practical implications. The fruits of your studies include intercellular signals of unprecedented structure the receptors and genes they control, and novel mechanisms by which they are regulated. Your work provides a deeper understanding of how quorum sensing signals connect the environment with the microbial world, allowing different bacterial species to communicate with each other, with their parasites, and with their eukaryotic hosts. As a result of your work, we now see the constantly communicating microbiological world as vastly more sophisticated and integral part of life on Earth. Your work brings microbes closer to our own view of our, our bodies, whose ability to coordinate cellular actions by signaling gives rise to collective properties that infinitely exceed those of its component parts. You've shown us the possibility of fighting pathogens, not simply by trying more efficiently to kill them, but by telling them in their own language, it's time to stop. Finally, with your legendary energy, you help the scientific community provide broader opportunities for the next generation of researchers, and you communicate to the greater public the importance, excitement, and true nature of scientific discovery. Bonnie Bassler, please come forward to receive the prize. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Dr. Bassler. Would you place your prize pin, please? Sure. So I understand that the symbolic moment of the Gruber Prize is when the recipient gets the pin placed on him or her. And so I think I will start by having the unique distinction of giving myself the Gruber Prize. <laughs> so first, let me make sure that you see it. So it's this beautiful pin. There's also a statue that I hope you can see. And it shows what you saw on the slides earlier, the genetics prize. So, so thank you. So I'm deeply touched by those words. And I am absolutely delighted to receive the Gruber Foundation's 2020 Genetics Prize. I thank you on behalf of the 25 years so far of graduate students, postdoctoral researchers, and research staff who have worked in my lab to make today possible. I never planned to be a geneticist. All of my schooling is in biochemistry. I lucked into a life-altering postdoc with a spectacular geneticist mentor, Michael Silverman, and I never looked back. Now, at my core, I am a geneticist. I am also a microbiologist. And as I convey my thank yous from my home office in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic and shutdown, I also thank the Gruber Foundation for recognizing the value of microbial research. The power of microbes, their relevance to basic and medical science, and their obvious impact on humankind are well demonstrated by COVID. 30,000 nucleotides, 30,000 A's, G's, U's, and C's wrapped up in a few proteins have brought the entire world to its knees. One cannot help but be awestruck by the power of this tiny virus. We are rightfully obsessed with COVID. But my job is to remind you that there are so many other fascinating microbes with equal power or with other wondrous features, like as one example, the ability to communicate and to orchestrate collective behaviors. Those microbes also deserve our attention. Bringing genetic strategies to the intensive study of microbes, both harmful and beneficial, are enabling us to discover new ways to confront infectious disease and to employ microbes to make us healthier, to grow our food, to clean up our pollution, and to make ingenious bio-inspired products. I take great pride in being awarded the Gruber Foundation's Genetics Prize this year of all years. Urgent questions need to be answered and can be answered by research groups engaged in the study of microbes. The value of science too easily goes in and out of fashion. I thank Mr. and Mrs. Gruber for their visionary and steadfast commitment to honoring the importance of scientific research. The Gruber Genetics Prize acknowledges genetics potential to alleviate human suffering. If ever modern society needed reminding that it must have scientists working for all of us, we have that reminder now. The Grubers already understood that imperative when they generously endowed this meaningful prize. Thank you for that foresight and thank you for recognizing the work of the Bassler Lab. And now uh, my science. And so I have the great privilege of getting to tell you a science story from my group. And in an effort to be forward looking, I'm going to tell you about a new project that we've been working on for the last couple years and then try to tell you where we're going. And so to do that, I have to share my screen. Do that. And I presume you can see that. Okay, so at the core of everything my gang does, our question is to try to understand how do bacteria get any bang for their buck? So we know that bacteria are harmful and they can kill us. Increasingly, we're learning that bacteria have all these magical beneficial properties that keep us alive. And my lab gets that. But what we wanna understand is whether bacteria are being harmful or they're being beneficial, how can they be either of those things? They're so tiny. So how do these itty bitty critters get this miraculous power? And so what we've shown is that the way that they do lots of these powerful tricks is by communicating, 
by counting their numbers and by recognizing when they have the right number of cells together that if they all do something in a coordinated manner, they can carry out tasks that they could never accomplish if they simply acted as individuals. And that process is called quorum sensing. So this slide shows how quorum sensing works. Bacteria have to understand times when they're alone from times when they're in communities so they can behave differently under those two different situations. And so this is how they do it. So on the left side of this slide, this gray oval, that's supposed to be my bacterial cell. And so at low cell density, when the bacteria are alone, they want to have the program of gene expression going that's good for acting as an individual. So they carry out some subset of the tasks that they're capable of doing, and among the things they do is that they make and release small molecules that we call autoinducers that are depicted as these red triangles. So the world is big, bacteria are small, under this condition the autoinducers diffuse away, the bacteria can't detect them, and that says act as an individual. But then as the bacteria grow and divide, since all of the cells are making a share of the autoinducer molecule, the concentration of this extracellular chemical increases in proportion to cell number. And when the molecule hits a particular threshold level, the bacteria detect it, and in unison, they all change their gene expression or change their behavior, and they begin to carry out group or collective tasks. And so what they're inferring from this detection event is that they must have neighbors around and they can act as a group. And so, in fact, the bacteria have no idea how many other cells are around. They're using this chemical as a proxy for cell number. And so now what we understand is that quorum sensing is the norm in the bacterial world. There are thousands of cases of quorum sensing bacteria, and they carry out all kinds of monumental tasks that the cells have to do it together, and then the task becomes successful. So that's quorum sensing. And so today what I want to do is just tell you one new story about quorum sensing in one of the bacteria we study. And so that's the global pathogen Vibrio cholera. And you might know that people get contaminated with cholera by ingesting um, food or water that's got cholera bacteria in it. And the disease that cholera causes is an acute one. And the strategy is cholera gets in at low cell numbers and it's highly, highly infectious. And then in the intestine, it multiplies. And when it gets to high number, it turns off its virulence factors, turns on an escape program. And in this terrible diarrheal disease, cholera comes out by the gazillions to infect the next patient. And so those transitions, the get in and get out strategy, are controlled by quorum sensing. So cholera cannot be a pathogen unless it has quorum sensing communication. So we discovered quorum sensing in cholera and we discovered that there are multiple quorum sensing systems in this bug and they all work sort of the same. And so I'm going to focus on one quorum sensing system. It's the system that we discovered most recently just a couple years ago. So here's how it works. At low cell density, when cholera enters the human host, it's, the cells are alone and they're highly infectious. So all of their virulence genes are on. So under this condition, at low cell density, that autoinducer, the chemical word, that's not present. So the receptor for the autoinducer, a transcription factor that we call VQMA, it's, it's inert, it's inactive because there's no autoinducer present and that allows virulence to happen. But then in the host, the bacteria grow and they make and release autoinducers. The one that's pertinent for today's conversation is this molecule that we named DPO. So as the cells are growing, this autoinducer is increasing in a concentration. And at a particular concentration, it can be bound by this VQMA receptor. And when that happens, VQMA becomes active. It turns on the expression of a gene that we call VQMR that encodes a small RNA, so Vibrio quorum RNA. This RNA turns off all of the virulence genes and turns on the escape program. So now you get it. At low cell density, cholera is infected. At high cell density, it says time to get out of here, and it escapes. And quorum sensing controls those transitions. So a graduate student in the lab, Justin Silpi, he's the one that figured out the, the um, identity of this molecule. So down here, this is the actual chemical that is the DPO autoinducer. And it's a simple, tiny little molecule, but it is a brand new molecule to mankind. And so once we had gotten this far in our studies, Justin noticed this anomaly. And so it was the following. What he noticed is that many, many species of bacteria make the DPO autoinducers. However, 
only Vibrios seem to have the VQMA receptor. So every Vibrio species, every Vibrio has a VQMA protein and nobody but Vibrios in the bacterial world have the VQMA protein. So Justin was perplexed by this apparent asymmetry between production of the molecule and detection of the molecule. And he was trying to figure that out. And I have to confess that we've never satisfactorily understood that question, and I'll come back to that at the end. But Justin found something amazing along the way that I'm gonna tell you about today because we started to study it. So when he was looking for VQMA genes, in the bacterial world, they were only in Vibrios, but he did find one other VQMA gene, and it was on a virus, so not a bacterium, on a virus. So he found a phage, which is a virus that infects bacteria, and so these viruses infect Vibrios. He found this genome in the database of this unstudied phage virus, and here's just a portion of the genome. And on this genome, it looked like it had the gene for our quorum sensing receptor. So we got very excited about that because quorum sensing is supposed to be about bacteria talking to each other. So we were wondering what the heck is a quorum sensing receptor doing on a virus? and we wanted to study it. So first I wanna bring your attention to the right-hand part of this figure. So what you might know about phages or viruses is that they have to decide stay or go in their bacterial host. So lysogeny, stay, or lysis, go. Stay, go, stay, go. Should I stay in my host or should I kill my host and go to the next victim? And so in classic textbooks, that is mediated by genes that look like these. And so we had a clue for how that decision might be made on our virus. And so the way this has been worked out by scientists long before us is that the lysis lysogeny switch in many viruses or phages is determined by this protein called C1. C1 is a repressor of an activator called Q that turns on the lytic genes. And so what happens is that when viruses are in their bacterial hosts, if the hosts get in trouble, so the hosts get you have DNA damage or they get stressed out, the viruses says, I'm getting out of here. And so what happens is under those conditions, the C1 protein gets cleaved, that inactivates it, Q is no longer repressed and it turns on the lytic genes. So under stress conditions, the viruses kill their host and they escape. And so we could see those genes on our new virus and Justin tested this and sure enough, just like in a textbook, the lysis lysogeny decision, we could understand the mechanism. It's exactly like scientists before us had discovered. So we could sort of dispense with this right-hand part of the genome, but what we were really curious about is over here. Why is there an apparent quorum sensing receptor on a virus? And why is our quorum sensing receptor there? And so we wanted to study that. And so I've already told you that we had just discovered this VQMA receptor. And I also told you that VQMA's job in the host, Vibrio cholera, is to detect that autoinducer DPO, get activated, and then regulate gene expression. And so we thought maybe we could study that kind of a thing, but in this virus. And so here's the experiment that Justin did. He took Vibrio cholera and he infected them with the phage. So now the cholera has this virus in it. And then what we did is we just did a growth curve. Now, it's important to tell you that these cholera don't make their own DPO autoinducer, but we can synthesize that in a test tube and add it when we want. Okay, so in the absence of the autoinducer, even though the phage is there, what you can see is the cholera grows just fine. But then if Justin adds DPO, the quorum sensing autoinducer, look what happens. All of the cells die. And that was dependent on the phage. And so what that told us, this experiment, is that this phage is eavesdropping on quorum sensing, on host quorum sensing. It's recognizing this quorum sensing molecule, binding to it, and then using that information to launch its lytic cascade. So what we think that means is that this virus is tracking the cell density of the host. Because remember, what's the decision the virus has to make? It's should I stay or should I kill this host and go to the next host? We think this is a really insidious strategy. The virus is tracking when the host cells are at high cell number and then it kills them and that maximizes transmission to the next cell because the virus only does it when there's lots of bacterial prey in the vicinity. So it's eavesdropping on quorum sensing. And so we got um, interested in that result because there had never been a connection between quorum sensing and viruses before.
And so the next task for us was to figure out how does this eavesdropping program get connected to this textbook Lysis program. And so we had some pretty easy guesses. So first we thought, well, this is a transcription factor. If when the phage receptor is bound to DPO, it just turns on Q, that would work. So Justin tested that completely wrong. And so then we thought, okay, well, we could think of another me mechanism. If this complex repressed the repressor, that would also launch the circuit. Justin tested that, and that was completely wrong. Okay, so now we were out of genes that we understood, right? So what we had to infer from those two results is that there must be some missing link that connects this circuit, right, and allows quorum sensing to drive lysis. And so we wanted to try to understand what that was. And so to do that, Justin decided to do a genetic screen. And so here's the logic. What you get is it's all about turning on Q. So what Justin did was he cloned the Q promoter, so the promoter for the Q gene, in front of the luciferase genes. And so he put this construct, the C1 protein, and the phage receptor into recombinant E. coli. So now this E. coli is dark because we're missing something that completes the circuit. So it makes no light. So then one, what Justin could do is he could just chop up the viral genome, shotgun clone that into a vector, and put this, vec this little library into this recombinant E. coli and look for an E. coli that now made light. Right? The idea being that some gene from the virus would co complete this circuit and allow it to function. And sure enough, that worked. And Justin found exactly one gene on his clone that appeared to be the missing link. So we could sequence that region and we could map it back to the viral genome. And so we did that and it turned out that the gene Justin found was right here. It's this little red gene that's sitting right next to the quorum sensing receptor but running in the opposite direction. So we had the sequence of the gene and it encodes a 79 amino acid protein. So a tiny little protein. And when we did a database analysis, and in this case of all databases, this protein has no homology to anything in any database. So it's a brand new protein. And so because of that, Justin got to give this protein his, his own name. And so he named it Q-tip. And that stands for Quorum Triggered inactivator of C1 protein. So Q-tip is our missing link. Okay, so the next thing we wanted to figure out now that we had our hands on this component was how does Q-tip um, uh, launch this lysis program? And so I'm just gonna show you what we found. So what you're looking, I'm gonna just show you the Q-tip sequesters C1. So what you're looking at here, this is E. coli that's carrying the C1 protein from the phage and there's a halo tag on it, so they're fluorescent. And what you can see is that the fluorescence is diffuse in the cytoplasm. So now, if Justin clones into that E. coli Q-tip, what you can see is that Q-tip sequesters C1 into these big oligomers. All of it comes out of solution in inclusion bodies and it sits at the poles. And so I hope what you can see is that these cells now look like little Q-tips and that's how this protein got its name. So the job of Q-tip is to drag C1 out of solution. And what we showed is that when Q-tip does this, C1 is inactive. So C1 here is active, to repress lysis, C1 here is inactive to repress lysis. So that sequestration inactivates the protein. Okay, so now let me put together what I've told you so far. What we have is this eavesdropping phage, but it has two mechanisms to control its lifestyle choices between lysis and lysogeny. The first one comes out of a textbook. When the host Vibrio is in trouble, the phage detects SOS or DNA damage, C1 is cleaved, that unleashes Q, Q turns on the lysis program and the phage kills the host. The second input is brand new, it's quorum sensing. The phage is monitoring host, the Vibrio host cell density using this little molecule DPO as information. When the receptor binds DPO, it activates transcription of Q-tip, Q-tip gets made, it binds to C1 and drags it out of solution. So the fate of C1 is different. It's either cleaved or it's put in an oligomer, but the outcome to the cell is exactly the same. Q is unrepressed and it causes lysis to happen. So one mechanism is a textbook. One mechanism is about sensing host biology. So there's two inputs. 
But if you're also listening, which I hope you are, there's also two quorum sensing systems working here. So I'm telling you about this phage quorum sensing, but remember cholera is also using quorum sensing. It's also trying to track its cell density. So what you'll remember from my first slide is the cholera has its own VQMA receptor. It also binds this DPO chemical, and that event turns on the expression of this small RNA VQMR, which controls hundreds of quorum sensing genes that allow cholera to be a pathogen. And what we showed is that this phage complex also binds here to drive these genes. So while this phage is preparing to execute its host, it is also messing with all of the host's biology by altering the expression of hundreds of host genes. And so right now, we don't know what good it does the phage to do that, you know, and to mess up all of this host biology, but we're trying to study that. Okay, so once we got this far in our studies and we had this idea that these phages, um, this phage could eavesdrop on host biology, we started to worry that this was just some anomaly of this phage that we had found a genome and studied. And so we wondered if this kind of host sensing could be more generic. So with this little module in hand, we went back to databases and asked, could we find more examples? And sure enough, when Justin did that database analysis, we found lots and lots and lots of phages, all of them unstudied, that contain this classic textbook lysis lysogeny set of genes, and they all contain a transcription factor and then a little red gene in this same place on the genome. And so all of these little red genes, they encode tiny proteins that have no homology to one another, but we cloned all of these out. And sure enough, every one of these red proteins can sequester every one of these green C1 proteins. So what we think then is that all of these phages use this Q-tip-like mechanism to drive host or to drive the lysis lysogeny decision. So we think this is gonna be general, that there is brought widespread interactions between these phages and hosts. And so what I mean by that is in the circuit that I'm telling you about, our phage is listening in on this DPO density sensing molecule to get information about the host cell density so it can decide when is the optimal time to kill the host and escape to the next prey. In all of these other viruses that we've found, what we can see is that they're all going to launch the, these programs with this Q-tip-like mechanism. But these transcription factors are not quorum sensing receptors. They all have DNA binding domains and they're all built to bind some molecule. But we don't know what host biology these other phages are listening into. What we presume is that each phage has evolved to listen into appropriate host biology or host signals that have to do with its particular host and the particular niche that it lives in. And so we're trying to understand that, these other phages now. And so what I'm telling you is that these phages are rewiring this circuit to be specific to different pieces of information. And when we saw that, we thought, well, hey, now if these phages can rewire this circuit to be responsive to on-demand cues, we could do the same thing. And so what we thought we could do is take what we'd learn in these basic science studies of ours and do something applied. And that is to make new phage therapies in order to kill pathogenic bacteria on demand. And so um, what I haven't told you is that our phage lives as a plasmid. It never integrates into the bacterial genome. It just goes in as a plasmid. So we can pop this phage into any bacterial cell, any species we want by transformation. And so what we thought we could do is to test whether we could make a phage therapy for different pathogens. Okay, so here's the logic. This is our phage, and you get, as I've told you, it's about turning on Q, and then lysis happens. So what we did was we replaced the natural Q promoter with other promoters that we could control. And I'm just gonna show you one example. So what Justin did was he put the promoter called IMVF, which exists in Salmonella, in front of Q. So the phage is the phage plus 100 bases of Salmonella DNA. And so now the way it works in Salmonella, which you know is a terrible pathogen, is that when Salmonella is going to invade host cells, it has a transcription factor called HIL-A. HIL-A's job is to detect virulence conditions, turn on IMFF, and Salmonella invades. 
So now we've put this INVF promoter on the plasmid. When we put that phage plasmid into salmonella and then we put it under virulence conditions, Hill A does its job. It binds INVEF and it turns it on. But in this case, Q turns on. And so what happens is all the salmonella kill themselves. And so we've made this phage therapy that specifically kills salmonella only under virulence conditions. And so hopefully you get the idea and you can use your imagination from that. We made a whole set of these and the, it's modular. And so the idea is if you have a controllable promoter, you can pop it in front of Q and get this lysis trick to happen on demand if you know the stimulus to turn on your promoter. And so we really hope that other scientists will take this gadget and make it into a real phage therapy to combat terrible pathogens. And so now I want to finish up and go away from the applied part of the work and come back to the natural basic studies and try my best to put together what I've told you and tell you where we're going. Okay, so now you know cholera, you know it's this pathogen, and it's got to make this decision, stay or go, stay or go. Should it be in the host or should it escape? And the way it mediates that decision is by quorum sensing. So it's measuring the buildup of this molecule DPO, this autoinducer that it makes at high cell density, DPO binds VQMA, and then that tells cholera, stop being a pathogen, escape and infect the next victim. You'll remember that I also told you that we discovered that lots of bacterial species make DPO, this autoinducer. And so those species include microbiome bacteria that live in the intestine. And so what we've shown is that these bacteria make DPO, and in mouse models, when that happens, cholera disperses early. So, right, because cholera miscounts, because there's all this DPO there, and so it leaves the host and the disease isn't as bad in a mouse. And so what we think that means is that your microbiome, your own microbiome, is working for you and using this DPO quorum sensing molecule to fend off pathogens and keep you healthy. What I haven't told you is that you, your intestinal cells, are part of this conversation. So DPO, this simple molecule, is made from the amino acid threonine. So your intestinal cells are covered with a human protein that's called mucin. Every third amino acid in mucin is threonine. Your microbiome eats mucin, it's supposed to, and doing that gives it threonine, and the microbiome uses that threonine to make the DPO that fends off the pathogen. So we think this is an inter-kingdom conversation. You, the human host, supply the substrate to your microbiome to make a quorum sensing molecule that helps to confuse this pathogen. And now we have to bring in one more kingdom, that's the phages. So they too are trying to use the, the information encoded in this molecule to optimize lifestyle decisions. So in this case, the phage, the parasite of the parasite, is detecting this DPO autoinducer and making a similar lifestyle decision as cholera. Stay or go, stay or go. Should I stay in my host or should I kill it? And so by monitoring cell density, this phage has figured out a way to, to find the optimal time to escape its current host and go to the next victim. And so what we think then is that all of these organisms are trying to use the information in this simple molecule to make lifestyle choices about virulence and pathogenicity as well as health. And so to finish with a confession, we do not understand how anybody gets robust information out of this molecule, given that all of these shenanigans are going on. And so now our job is to get out of the test tube and try to understand how does quorum sensing really play out and how do these organisms across these kingdoms get information that's useful out of this simple molecule and other quorum sensing molecules that we discovered. So trying to study it in these contexts is one of our goals and we're moving towards it. And so I want to finish there and um, show you who did the work. And so, of course, I told you one fun story that we're working on now. And most of that work was done by Justin Silpi, a graduate student in the lab. And he just graduated remotely and got his PhD. And he's off to Harvard to start a postdoc. And of course, I picked that story. But what I want to uh, remind you is that many, many people have 
given me the great joy of coming through this lab and working on this project that made today happen. And this is a really special year. It's my 25th year at Princeton. I've spent my entire career there. Princeton hired me when I was a nobody and I was working on this crazy project or this idea that bacteria could talk to each other. And everybody who's ever worked for me came back for a big celebration of 25 years. All of these people somehow decided that was a good adventure to go on and they joined in and collectively we made all of the discoveries for which I and my lab as being honored today. They have given me the greatest 25 years that I could ever imagine. They're the best scientists um, in the world and I just want to say that I am so lucky to have had them in my life and on behalf of the collective work that this collective group of people did together I am accepting the Gruber Prize on behalf of my gang and I thank you. Thank you Bonnie that was fabulous uh, and we have a number of questions from the audience. Uh, I'll just I don't know if I'll have time to, to go through all of these, but let's just start with one. Ophelia Papoulas asks, do the phage and Vibrio VPQMs have the same threshold or is there some uh, differences between those two molecules that are in the interests of those organisms, different yeah. organisms? Yep, great question. So we studied that. We have VQMA uh, uh, purified and crystallized. And it turns out that each of those VQM, Chem QMA proteins have the same affinity for the DPO molecule, but they have different affinities for the DNA binding site. And so it turns out the host VQMA is a little bit better, a couple times better at binding DNA than the phage VQMA, but that they can both bind the molecule equally. Great. And Andre Sa asks, why do you believe VQMA is located in the viral genome? If the phage only had Q-tip, it would still work since the bacteria itself is expressing VQMA and DPO quorum sensing receptors. Yeah, that's a great question and it's connected to the last one. So it turns out, so the worst thing that cholera could do is let its VQMA bind the Q-tip promoter because then it would kill itself. So those VQMAs, the phage VQMA binds both the Q-tip promoter and the host promoter. The cholera VQMA is incapable of binding in front of Q-tip. So in fact, so it avoids turning that process on and killing itself. So, so the phage had to come with some way to turn that on itself. Yeah. So that's another asymmetry in this system. But that one sort of makes sense evolutionarily, right? Because the, the host would kill itself otherwise. Great. Well, Brendan McShane would like to know, do the red proteins, uh, the ones that cause the, the aggregation, uh, have acidic hydrophobic hallmarks of phase separating proteins? And, and what have you learned about how they actually work? Yeah, so Q-tip is currently giving us fits, right? So it's a tiny little protein, you'd think it'd be so easy, but when we purify it, it comes out as an as a aggregate, right? Of course, that's its job. And so it, it might have phase separation, um, we're trying to look for that, but it's an awfully small protein to see big domains. We do now have mutants that can bind C1 and don't aggregate, and ones that, that you know, are active and inactive. And so we're really trying to use genetics to figure that out. And what we'd love is a crystal structure of that protein. But so far, um, little protein, big problem. <laughs> Great. Uh, Timothy Fuqua asks, any ideas how this could actually be practically used to treat cholera. That's yeah, really right. So there's two. One that I talked about today, mm -hmm. right? Hopefully the phage therapy could be used for lots of bacteria and people could work on that. But you get it. When autoinducers are there, cholera disperses. So our fantasy and what we want to try to do is to add either DPO or maybe three and right? Something that's cheap, that's small, like maybe you could give people or get your microbiome to make extra DPO or give them threonine and then you could use it to try to get cholera to disperse. Now that is a fantasy, right? But we're trying to work on that in mice, which aren't, which aren't the best, um, you know, cholera is a human disease, so it's not the best 
model system, but we would love to be able to short circuit quorum sensing in cholera and then in other pathogens. And Dr. Spradling said that, you know, but we think that the DPO might be a really good way because it's so simple, it's cheap, you know, people that are that are poor people that get cholera, you know, maybe you could actually make a viable strategy that way. Uh, Jose Tellis Reyes says, uh, wants to know, you could the virus have additional genes in addition to VQMA and Q-tip that are involved in the circuit you described? Or is it just a simple direct two gene circuit? So, so far we can just put those components into E. coli and it works, right? However, you know, I just showed you a little part of the genome. There's all these other genes on there that we don't know what they do. They have no homology to phage genes, no homology to other genes. There's definitely transcription factors. And so the possibility that there's other sensory circuits, you know, on it, that we can't recognize, that absolutely exi it exists, that it's taking in lots of information to control this decision. But at least for quorum sensing, the minimal components I showed you, that's all it needs. Good. Uh, do you have any insight into the evolutionary origin of Q-tip and other antirepressors, or were they so small they could just uh, evolve de novo? Yeah, so we don't, so each of those red Q-tip-like genes and proteins, none of them looks like each other. And none of them looks like anything else in the database. So it's, they all are functionally equivalent, at least the ones we've tested. And so I find that a really curious question because we don't know where any of them came from and it doesn't look like they came from each other, right? And so the real answer, long, no. I don't have insight into that, but um, hopefully when more of these genomes come out, we might be able to make better sense out of that. Kangxi Mujal asks, is uh, there any difference in the DPO sensitivity in pathogenic bacteria versus colon bacteria? Do the, path, do the phages that use this mechanism also infect colon bacteria? We don't know that. So we now wanna, we, uh, so the answer is we don't know. This phage is a Vibrio phage. So we can transform it into anybody, but it infects Vibrio. So we think this phage doesn't infect uh, bacteria that would be in your intestine. But we do know that your intestine is loaded with phages, right? And so the idea that there could be some analog there and whether they sense DPO or another molecule, uh, we don't know that yet. But we are trying to figure out now, remember I told you there's this asymmetry about DPO being broadly made and we only understand VQMA as the receptor. Now what we're doing is taking microbiome bacteria that make DPO and trying to find how do they, do they detect it and how? It's not gonna be through VQMA. And so hopefully we'll figure that out. We have a genetic experiment, obviously, to get there and um, that's on our plate to do. Nicole Bush asks, have you found any phages with Q-tip that uh, incorporate into the host genome or is there some connection to circularized phages in this mechanism? Right, so so far, the family of phages that we found that have this Q-tip-like protein, they are all plasmid-like phages. And we don't know what, you know, so far those go together. Plasmid-like phages are understudied. And uh, so far that's the pattern, right? And we don't know what that means, like why it's successful not to, to get into the genome. But what we do think is that it does give these phages another way to get into other cells, you know, by transformation or by conjugation, right? They have a way into cells that are not their natural hosts. Okay, I'm sorry, but uh, we're getting close to the end here. And I'd like to just turn it over to Sarah to say one final uh, word. All right, everybody, thank you. Congratulations again, Dr. Bassler. Thank you, Dr. Spradling. Thank you, GSA. And thanks all of you for attending. We had uh, almost a thousand people tuned in for that. And um, congratulations, Bonnie Bassler. Good morning. My heartfelt thank you to the Gruber Foundation. Thank you.